Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is from John 2, verses 1 and 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. We have had a couple gorgeous days here, haven't we? We're going to get out today and go enjoy some more. What a blessing it is that we can, even though it's beautiful outside, we can take a moment to uh, worship our God in spirit and truth and and study about him and pray to him, and, and that's always a blessing. Um, and it's always good that we can be here. Um, if, if we're truly trying to escape the world, if we if, if the world is truly our enemy, if, if the world is truly a place that we don't like, um, if, if the church is truly our home, it gives us comfort and it gives us peace, then we ought to be glad to be here. It should be a wonderful thing that we can be here amongst the saints and, and outside of all of that out there just for a moment because we got to leave here and go back to it, unfortunately. Um, this morning we're going to talk about the good wine. When, when we when, Typically, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, there's a lot of points that come out of John 2 when, it, when we start talking about the the wine um, that Jesus made and so on and so forth. There's a lot of people that spend a lot of time talking about this passage, and we may be missing the point if we're arguing some of these small things. And that's what we're going to talk about um, this morning. Why did Jesus make the wine? Why did he do it at the time that he did it? And what is the significance of it? And why did the head waiter have such a remarkable response to Jesus? Why was he just like, wow, like this is amazing that you made wine? Not, not the fact of the, of, of the miracle of the wine, but of the wine, the quality of the wine and the placement of the wine. So we have a lot to talk about this morning because it gives us a clue about Jesus and it also points to us inwardly what we should be like as Christians when, when we have Christ in our lives. So there's a lot to talk about, but before we do, as always, let's go to God in prayer. Eternal Father in heaven, we humbly, your servants come before you. So thankful, Father, for this time. So thankful for everything that you've done for us. So thankful for um, these, these many, many blessings that you give us, Father, that, that we don't deserve. Uh, be with us in this lesson. Help us to uh, focus on you and help us to focus on your words and help us to learn from um, all the things that you have in the scriptures. Help us to be better as we walk out of here. And we pray this in the name of Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. There's a lot we can say about this turning water into wine. When you think about Jesus turning water into wine, um, there's a lot of things that happen, and there's also a lot of arguing that goes along about this particular passage. And the reason why there's arguing about it is is why. why. Why are people arguing about this passage? They're not arguing the placement, when did Jesus make the wine? They're not arguing about the head bridegroom. They're arguing, was it juice? Or was it wine? Is that right? That's what people are talking about most of the time. People are trying to figure out exactly what's going on here. Did Jesus make wine? And did that give me permission as a Christian to go do this? And is Jesus condoning this? And blah, blah, blah. All this other stuff. When you talk about John 2 and him turning water into wine at the wedding. And just like with Jesus in a lot of situations, if we just look at the surface level and find something to bicker about, we may be missing the point. I will say this, what was one of the first miracles that Moses did with Pharaoh? He turned water into what? Blood with the Jordan River, right? That's, that's, that's what he did, it, whatever river it was. I think I maybe messed up the river. But he turned water into, into the Nile, my bad, the Nile. I think of Jordan all the time, it was the Nile. That's not funny, Sarah. But anyway, he turned water into blood. And that was one of the first miracles of Jesus, and you, uh, I'm sorry, of, of Moses. And then when you fast forward the clock, one of the first miracles of Jesus is turning water into wine. Now, now, why would he pick this out of all things to do? And why would he even tell his mother, you know, my hour hadn't come yet? There's a lot to talk about with this passage. And I know this may be a very weird title 
to hear the, the good wine. You typically don't show up to worship and hear a title called the good wine. But welcome to Renton, baby. So first, we'll start with why. Why is all of this stuff going on? What is the point? Let's start here. So John 2, as our brother read, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and disciples were invited to this wedding. This was a wedding feast. This was a big deal. In the culture, if somebody was going to get wedded, uh, married, there wasn't a lot of uh, things that we have today. But let me tell you one thing that they did do that we have today. They ate, and they ate very well. And this wedding feast was a big deal. As a matter of fact, it was kind of your place in society, depending on how big of a feast you had, depending on how many folks were invited, depending on how elaborate the, the, the celebration was, that kind of told exactly who you were in society. And we go to John 2 and 3, and when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. We ran out. This is a big deal. I mean, could you imagine that this is the focal point? Of, of their wedding. This is the focal point of what was going on, and they ran out of wine. This is a big deal. And, I, and I'll say it from the perspective of, would it be a big deal to Jesus? Probably not. And, and that's why it's important for us to understand why he did what he did in the first place. Uh, uh, chapter 2 and verse 4, why did it say Jesus 2? We're off to a great start. And Jesus said to her, woman, what, it, uh, what was that that have uh, to do with us? My hour has not yet come. He said woman, and he kind of said it in a stern way, if you will. Um, and, and, and this woman can be translated or madam or wife, but he's saying to his mother, hey, this ain't that big of a deal to me. This is not, I, I'm not super concerned about that. And there's a lot we can learn from just this interaction between Jesus and his mother. Not one time can we see in the scriptures Jesus bowing down to Mary as if she was the one who made him. Not one time can we see it. Jesus always understood that, yeah, I came from her, I'm going to respect her, but I came from heaven. And that's a lesson to us as, as Christians to know our place and so on and so forth. John uh, 2 and 5 says, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. So she must have got the message really clear when, when, when Jesus says, woman, this ain't the time. She must have got the message because she tells the, the, the folks there, whatever he says to you, do it. Mary also knew that that, that, that Jesus was, in fact, superior to her. She also knew that, that Jesus had the right answer. She understood, even as his mother, that Jesus' way was probably going to be the best way to go in this situation. Now, she did put up a fight. Well, it, it's not like she wasn't worried, because she was. If she wasn't, she wouldn't have came up to Jesus and said, we ran out of wine. But after Jesus spoke, she knew her place. After Jesus says, this is what it is, she knew her place. And we, my brothers and sisters in Christ, should know our place. When it comes down to spiritual things, we should not be the people that are second-guessing Jesus and his ways. We should not be a people that are wondering, uh, are his ways the best ways? Now, just like the mother of Jesus, it's perfectly fine to worry sometimes because we have a God that we can cast those cares on. But as soon as we approach with the truth, as soon as we approach with the word of what Jesus said, it should stop. And we should go to what our Jesus has been saying from the entire time. John 2 and 6, now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. And just so for context, Mark 7, 3 and 4 points it out, for the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they carefully washed their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders, and when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and copper pots. So this pot, and this is, this is one that I could find that, that may have been closely related to what they had, this pot was huge. This wasn't like, I know like in, in the traditional pictures that we get of, of the wine, you know, you, 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 a lot, and I even saw it, you have people carrying around these pots. They weren't carrying around these pots, ladies and gentlemen. They were huge. They were heavy. And, and, and they served a purpose. And, they, and, and all together, it was around 150 gallons of water. And there was only like three or four pots, so you do the math. Ain't nobody picking up 40 gallons of water 
and just carrying it around. Um, if, if you've ever tried to do that, you know that that's not happening. John 2 and 7, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water so they fill them up to the brim. Now see, to us, to us, it's like, of course they're going to fill up the water pot because we know how the story ends. But if they ran out of wine and Jesus is telling them to fill up the water pots, that wouldn't have been a normal request. All right, we're out of wine, and you're telling us to fill up the water pots. We don't want water, Jesus. We want wine. That's what they would have been thinking. But they said, Jesus is fill up the, the, the water pots. All the way to the top, he says. Don't leave any room. Fill it all the way up to the top. Make sure that it's all the way full. John 2 and 8, and he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took him. Now, remember, this head waiter could have been a bridegroom. It could have been the, the, the main guy. It could have been a lot of people. We don't know exactly who it is by, by looking at some of the traditions, but it, it could have been anybody at that point. So that's what they did. And John 2 and 9, when the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and didn't know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew the head waiter called the bridegroom. So at this point, now the water is wine. As they drew it out, this water is wine. And, 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 it's, and, and as we're fixing to read here, this is not regular wine. Listen to what it said, John 2 and 10. And said to him, every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. He's making a point here. He says at a wedding, at a wedding, at, at a wedding feast, Everybody's going to be drinking at the beginning, so they provide really good stuff. They're going to provide the good, wonderful wine. And then once everybody's had their fill, once everybody's done their drinking, then they give out the bad wine because it doesn't matter at that point. They're already full of good wine, so they don't really care if they have bad wine. That's what the waiter is saying. I mean, it's right there in the scriptures. And I, I wondered how I was going to say this, and I, I didn't prepare at all, right? But, but I will say um, some folks know that that's probably true. Um, if, you, if you've had the good stuff first, really doesn't matter what you have after that b because you're already at the point where it doesn't matter anymore. And, and so that's what was going on at this wedding feast. And so what people would do is they'd have all these nice, just to save money, they have all this nice wine at the beginning, and then once everybody in the South, as they say, get a snoop full, then they'll switch over to the bad wine, and it's like nobody cares if this is $2 wine because we've already had the good stuff. So the head waiter is saying to Jesus, now wait a minute. We've already had some good stuff. And here we are, after we've run out, we're expecting to get some mediocre stuff or some bad wine. And here you are giving us some great wine. At the end, this doesn't make sense. Why would you give us this good wine at the end when you could have given it to us at the beginning? And on top of that, Jesus makes this wine. It's a very interesting concept there. Very interesting concept. This waiter is surprised. Just think about it. If it was the bridegroom, then he has probably had a few cups of wine and knows what good wine is because he's putting on this wedding. If it was a waiter, he's, he does this every day. So he probably knows what a good glass of wine is. So for, for him to be amazed at this wine, had to, this, this had to be some really, really good stuff. And, and a lot of times we, we, we focus on the part about drinking and, and, and alcohol and so on and so forth, and, and we're not focusing on the quality and the placement of what Jesus said and what he did at that time. And when we talk about what Jesus did, we have to talk about why. Why would this waiter say this, and why would Jesus do it in such a manner? Because Jesus could have easily said, I'm not making any wine. He could have easily said, you're good, you already had your fill. But for some reason, he decided to make wine, and for some reason, he said, I'm going to make good wine. The answer is why? And I'm going to share a couple thoughts on it. First is, with God, the best is last. With us, the best is first. When Jesus was setting out on his ministry, this is the, one of the very first miracles that he made, and he is making a point to all the world that when I come into the picture, it automatically turns better. 
the way it's been from the beginning. That's the way it is now, and that's the way it's always going to be with God. And sometimes we miss that point. And he was making this point at a wedding to show that, hey, this is a bad situation, but with me, even with all of your behavior, even with everything that you have going on, and I'm sure there were some people at that party had probably had too much, but with Jesus, he makes it okay. Let me give you a couple examples if you never thought about it. Colossians 1 18 says he's also the head of the body of the church, and he's the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything, it says. That's what the, the, the scripture says. So let's talk about the law. Which was better, the law or Jesus? Obviously, it was Jesus, and the reason why we know that is because Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the private. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. We talk about in our Hebrews class all the time that we don't want to live under the law. We don't want to have to wrestle a bull to the altar for, for our sins. We don't want to have to worry about every time we do something, we have to go kill an animal, we have to go do this sacrifice. We know that one sacrifice out of Christ is sufficient, and that is way better than the law. But the law came first. And then we have Jesus, and he's way better. What about ourselves? What about life itself? I'm 40. I'm a man. I'm 40. I'm 40. <laughs> I'm sorry. And, you know, people start to say when you turn a certain age, you look back and you realize your best days are behind. Let me tell you something. We can, we can say it all you want. By the time you get 40, things start to hurt a little bit more. And then we look back at these 18-year-olds. We have a few of them, 16, 17-year-olds here. And they're like, I'm tired. <laughs> and they have no idea, right? And the reason why is because in life, the best days are first. The best days are the days of our youth when it comes to physical activity and so on and so forth. We're not talking about maturity level now. We're not talking about maturity in Christ. We're just talking about our physical bodies, because spiritually, that's flipped. But our, our, our physical bodies, you can't tell me, and I know, you don't want to compete with an 18-year-old in sports in your 40s. Probably doesn't work out right, right? The best came first, because eventually our physical bodies have to die. That's just the truth. From the day that we're born, the time is dwindling down. The earth, when, when it was created, what was there first? A black void, right? There was nothing. And the scriptures say in Genesis 1 and 2, the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. There was nothing there. And then all of a sudden, God says, let there be light. The bad always comes first with God. Then comes the good. What about sin, for example? When we look at it, Proverbs 23, 32, and I picked this because it's talking about dry. Do not look at the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. When it comes down to sin, you know, it, it's pleasurable at first for a lot in a lot of situations. Nobody is, 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 and I won't say nobody, but in a lot of cases, people, when they sin, they get enjoyment out of it. 2 Timothy 4 and 3 says the reason why people do certain things is because they want to do it. They, they, their own desires is why people do what they do. And let's not say people. Let's, and, and I don't like it when preachers say people, so I'm going to make it real. That's why you and I do what we do every day when we sin is because we want to. Let's just come to terms with that. No, none of us ha has a gun to our head making us do something that's contrary to the will of God. We do it because we want to. That is the truth. You and I. And that's why we have to fix this internal heart, which will stop the sin problem. But nonetheless, when we're doing it, we're, we're not doing it because, oh, this is a bad thing. We do it because we enjoy it in a lot of cases. And then when God comes, he fixes this sin problem, and then we realize what it's really like to live like. The good comes later. The truth of the matter, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is that God and, and, and Jesus set forth this, this, this new way, this, this alternate way of being. 
where folks would live their entire lives and the only thing they would have to look for is death. The only thing that they would have to, 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 to be on the horizon is, 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 is not very bright. But when Jesus came along, he says, I got something better. That, that's the way that I am, and that's the way that my Father in heaven is. And when you look at us and you look at our lives, we can see that clear as day. If, and we're going to talk about this at the end of the lesson. If our life spiritually looks the same today than it did, you know, when we first came out of the water, then something's wrong because we can see through the scriptures, through Jesus even making wine, that when Jesus is introduced in the picture, it should and it's supposed to be better. So if it's not better spiritually, then why is that? We've been saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. God gives us this outlook on life. With Christ, their future should be bright, my brothers and sisters in Christ. They use a really small example like a wedding feast to kind of make that point. And I don't mean bright with material things on this earth. I mean bright with the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. That's what I mean by bright. That's what the scriptures mean by a bright future when it comes down to it. And, and, and as I've said before, looking back, at these situations, my brothers and sisters in Christ, when we look at this wine and look at the miracle that Jesus did, you know, if, if, if there's one thing that all of us should want in our Christian journey, and th that is peace. And we should want to have a peaceful relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, but most of all, we should want to have peace with God. We should want to know that we're not an enemy of God, and we should want to know that, like, as a matter of fact. We should want to have confidence that we're on the right side of God. And, and spiritually, we'll be able to have that through the scriptures. But at the end of the day, if we're looking back at our lives and we're reflecting and we're like, you know what? I came out of the water and my life was chaos. And I could say, me personally, that's the way it was for me. When I came out of the water, life was chaos. Tossed to and fro. Had no idea which way was up. Didn't understand simple fundamentals about life understood nothing about God, and now I look back at that situation and said, how did I make it without God? But if we're at this point now, we're standing, and we're, we're standing on that proverbial mountain looking back at our lives, and we still have spiritual chaos where we're just, we can't rest because there's so many things going on, because there's so many distractions, because there's so many conflicts, because there's so many of this, so many of that. Wait a minute, Jesus made wine at a time where it wasn't expected. In every single situation that Jesus comes into, he provides peace and order. Why do we not have that peace and order if we have all the tools? Ephesians 4 says he gives us all these preachers and teachers, evangelists, and all this other stuff. The answer ain't, well, God is failing me. That's never the answer. The answer is something with us is not getting us to the point that we need to be at. This is about growing. This is not about staying where we're at. This is about growing to a point that we're better. Our spiritual lives should be better after Christ. Things should improve. Second Peter 3 and 18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, Savior Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen, it says. And if you want to know the truth about us, the flesh was first, wasn't it? I spent years doing what Buck wanted to do, and I thought that it was great. I thought that was the good wine. I did. I thought, this is, listen, partying, going to places shouldn't go, being around people that I probably shouldn't be around, I thought that was, I thought that was living. You couldn't tell me the best thing for me to do is not go to a basketball game or a football game in Texas before I was a Christian and be with people and go get a snoop full at these games. You couldn't tell me that that wasn't the best way to live life. That's what I thought. And now, through the word, I know better. Not that I'm, you know, you know some wise person because I'm not, but through the word, I know better. And we've spent our entire lives doing it, when Christ comes in, it has to be a different outlook. 
So here's the judge. If we're, if we're looking at our lives over time and we don't have this mark in the middle, that's the cross, that Jesus died in, that everything is different afterward, our mind frame, the way we behave and so on and so forth, then we need to check ourselves. We need to take an honest look in the mirror and say, wow. And, and, and the first step in that, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is trusting that God's way is better. It's actually trusting that God has good wine. You couldn't tell me. I'm going to choose my words carefully. You couldn't, you, you just couldn't tell me that living a life devoted to God without drinking every day, you couldn't tell me that that would be better. I was convinced. I, I, I was, I, 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 let me tell you something. A lot of people, we talk about almost, I got time. We got 35 minutes, his visitors or the elders, I'm out of here. You couldn't tell me that in that time, we talk about the way we were raised and we talk about influences and so on and so forth. You couldn't tell me that partying and drinking and doing all, being with people and, and, and saying bad jokes and, and all this stuff, you couldn't tell me that wasn't a good time convinced of it. And, 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 and then now I look back because as a matter of fact, I remember coming out of the water and the preacher said, and I remember asking him vividly. I said, so you're the preacher? He says, yeah, because I was new to this. And I said, so I can't drink anymore? And he smiles at me. He says, that's like less than five or six, like Let's focus on lesson one, believing that, that Jesus is the Son of God. So you want to know what I did on Sunday? I asked him again because it was important to me. So are you telling me that I'm supposed to be happy and I can't go get a snoop full on Friday evening? That's what you're telling me. And he says, Brother Buck, I'm telling you that you'll have way more joy, way more peace, way more life on this side of it and that side. And he want to know what he said. He says, just trust God. That's what you got in the water for in the first place. Just trust God. You know, a, a lot of us struggle with a lot of things. It may be drinking. It may be cursing. It may be smoking. It may be a whole bunch of things. I'm telling you, it's better on the other side. Not because I say so, not even because I may be living it the best I can all the time. But I'm telling you because of our God, the father of Isaac, Isaac Abraham, Jacob, Abraham, I, I can't even talk today. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that it's better. And sometimes we don't even know what we're missing because we're so consumed with what we got and the life that we're living right now. I'm just saying, just try it and trust him, and then you'll be just like those folks at the wedding. I'm thinking I'm fixing to get something bad. I'm thinking I'm fixing to get something that's like leftover, and this is the best thing of the wedding. They're there thinking that they're fixing to get some leftover wine. They're thinking they're fixing to get some spoiled wine. They're thinking they're fixing to get some wine that's like, ah, okay. Little did they know, because Jesus was there, that was the highlight of the wedding. And if we give up all this stuff, then Jesus can be the highlight of our lives. And I'll say this lastly, even if everything goes bad here, and we can't think of some, some, some good things here. I want to introduce you to this concept called heaven. And a lot of times, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we talk about heaven, and we're like almost like, I got to whisper it. Like it's some emotional thing when it comes down to us talking about heaven. Well, I'll tell you, that's what I'm looking forward to. If it wasn't for heaven, I probably would not be in the shape that I'm in. I want to know without a shadow of a doubt that I have somewhere to go and that this hadn't all been for nothing. It has to be for something. And so even if our peace that we want, we're trying everything that we have because life is tough. But even if all what we have here is not good enough, we certainly have heaven. And we certainly know that heaven is better than this place that we're living in. 
If we're not better with Christ, then the answer is we need to work on ourselves. And if we don't realize, if we don't trust that life is far better doing it God's way than our way, we talked about it in the Hebrews class this morning. The first thing that we have to do is believe that he is. And once we believe that, everything else will fall into place. But I will tell you this, my brothers and sisters in Christ, our God has thoroughly equipped us to, to be in this situation. There is, you know, and how many times have we as Christians picked up the phone and said, brother, I want to have, sister, I want to have this new life with God. I want to abandon everything that I'm doing, but I'm scared and I'm lonely right now. And I'm hurting right now. I got so much going on. I feel like falling back into old ways and I feel like doing what makes, what is very comfortable to me. How many times do we pick up the phone and call our brothers and sisters of Christ and say, I'm struggling? I tried it once and it worked out great. And I'm not saying that to be funny, but it worked out great. I've told you this before, but that brother came and picked me up from my house and we rode around and said, I didn't want to do anything anymore, but go to bed. We walk in here on Sundays and we have, I say it all the time, we're dressed nice, we're smelling good, but we got problems if we didn't, the Bible wouldn't say so. And all of us that have problems, we need to deal with them the way that the Bible tells us, or we're going to keep in this routine of doing it our way, our way, our way, without using the resources that God told us, and we're just going to keep going down this road. Why not be free from all of that and have what God has prepared for us, something way better than we ever imagined? If you're here this morning and you've struggled with letting go of things of the past, and, and let me tell you, all of us have. All of us are still, you know, at a certain point, probably not in the place that we want to be. But I can, I can say that I'm thankful to God that I'm not who I used to be, and I, I know a lot of people feel that way. But if you struggle with this, then ask for the prayers of the church. That's God's way. Asking for the prayers of the church is certainly not man's way. That's, that's God's way. And if you struggle with it, then sincerely ask. If you want to be better about it, sincerely ask. And if you're, if you're not a Christian, then come join this family. As I say all the time, a royal family will be together forever, where we will be ushered in as the bride of Christ, where we will get our reward, where we will know what's better, and it will be better for all of eternity. Whatever your needs may be, come now as we stand together and sing.